I want to welcome everyone to the DAT Free 360 webinar, the three-step program to close more business in 2022. My name is Randy Kobach, and I am on the marketing team here at DAT. I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. And the main thing is um, you're going to notice that your lines are muted. And uh, we do want you to ask questions. So if you look at your screen, you'll see that gray bar that says questions. And if you click on the triangle, just type in your question, hit send, and Nate and Ben will, um, will have a time after they're done with their content to answer your questions. And the other thing I wanted to let you know that all registrants will um, receive a recording of the webinar. Last time we had some technical difficulties, um, but we're, we're confident that we're going to guard this recorded webinar so we can share it with all of you. And then lastly, we encourage you to participate. We have a poll question in the middle of the content, and uh, we also have a post-webinar survey. And the both of this, it really helps us. Uh, it helps the presenters with the poll question and um, with the webinar survey. Just by giving us that feedback, it helps us to keep improving these webinars. And in terms of the agenda, we'll um, go through introductions. And then we're going to do a summary of the webinar we had in October. I don't know how many of you on the line were able to participate in that the, the webinar from October, but the, the content today is kind of like a launching point from the five EV uh, strategies to get more shippers. So Nate and Ben will do a quick summary just so we're all on the same page. Then we'll move into the three-step program and talk about leveraging technology and then move into the Q&A. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Nate and, Nate and Ben so they can introduce themselves and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks, Randy. Take two. Um, I'm Nate Cross and obviously I've got Ben Kowalski here with me. Uh, we run Freight 360 and in a nutshell, uh, we do a weekly podcast all about freight brokering. We've got a, a website full of a ton of educational videos and blogs and downloadable content all circled around the freight brokering industry. So, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there on the internet about brokering and there's a very low barrier to entry. So we've seen a lot of new brokers enter into the space lately, whether they came from other industries or came from dispatching or driving a truck. So our goal has been over the last couple of years to you know, bring credible information to the market and make sure that folks understand um, what's true and what isn't and offer a lot of tips along the way too. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a side hobby of ours. We both work full-time in brokerage. I, I personally work for a company called Pierce Worldwide Logistics down in uh, Brentwood, Tennessee. Uh, and Ben's down in Florida himself. So Ben, if you wanna add anything on yourself, go for no, it. That's pretty comprehensive. Let's jump in and do a brief summary on what we covered last time to give anybody who wasn't in the last webinar a little background before we jump into today's topics. So five easy strategies to get more shippers was what we covered last time. And do you wanna run through these, Nate, and we'll kind of cover these back and forth? Absolutely, yeah, we won't go into too much depth, obviously, the, but the point of this is to, this the webinar back in October really springboards us into today's topic, which is um, growing your business into 2022. So um, the, the five strategies that we hit on, the first one was discovering a niche. Uh, and the reason that we say that is a lot of brokers, when they start out, they they want to just be the jack of all trades. They want to say, hey, I can do everything. I can do flatbed, open deck, reefer, specialized, sprinter vans. You know, I can do produce. I can do seafood. And at the end of the day, you know, they they end up being able to do a little bit of everything, but never really become proficient or a master in any specific niche of the market. And that does not have to be a commodity. It could or an equipment type. It could be a location. Um, or any kind of specialized type of uh, transportation move. Um, so we, our first tip was to discover your niche, become an expert in it, and that's gonna be your value add to the industry is that you're not gonna be that person that says, I can do anything you need um, and do it mediocre, but to find something that you're really good at and are passionate about and then excel at that. So that's our first one. Yeah, and I think I, to go a little bit further on that, right, like you want to be able to provide the most amount of value to your customers or to be able to go deep instead of wide, right? You want to be able to do and be proficient at something that really provides enough value to that customer that that relationship has stickiness, right, that they want to keep working with you. We don't want to be in a position where we do just a little bit for a whole lot of customers for a lot of reasons. One, 
it's a whole lot more time communicating with a lot of people than it is one or two. And second of all, when things shift and the market changes, those relationships tend to be the first ones to go. Because again, we are doing whatever it is that they happen to ask, there's not a whole lot of reason why they can't have that done by somebody else, right? We wanna have kind of a moat built around our business to where like we are doing these things that are so valued by this customer that they wanna continue working with us wherever the market is, right? So a yep. lot of those reasons, as well as being able to just penetrate customers, having a niche and having something to sell on is immensely beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And number two is batching your calls for efficiency. So the, the methodology here, and we did a full episode on it if you look on our website, is um, is to, to have some kind of a purpose and some uh, intentionality behind your, your cold calling and your dialing time and your prospecting, right? So by efficiency, we mean things like, gather all of your calls for your prospecting time the day before or the evening before and group them into, into likeness, right? So if you're going to, maybe you're going to call all steel shippers or all produce shippers um, during a certain period of time. And the reason for this is each call, you're going to, inside your mind and mentally, you're going to build confidence and you're going to find your voice so much better on the phone, right? You're talking about the same things over and over and you'll probably be learning from the people on the other end of the phone too, right? You might be talking about a certain thing going on in the market and they're gonna respond and tell you a similar story or something that you didn't even know um, yourself beforehand and you can carry those on to your next call. So batching them together is gonna keep it way more efficient um, and it, it's just gonna drive better results long term. Yep, long and short of it, make sure these are two separate activities. You either wanna be calling or generating leads. You do not want them mixed together. You do not want to be making a dial and then meandering around till you find your next lead to make the next call, right? It's not effective. It's not efficient. We want to be doing this, the like activities together. We get more proficient. We get faster at it. We get more effective at it, right? Yep. So the next one was to gather your prospects from everyday sources. So it's not just a matter of having to, to Google every single lead, right? Or try to get a referral for every lead. Think about everyday sources, right? Look around you. Um, you know, what it, the, the bottle of water that you're drinking or the, the snack bar that you're eating, it was manufactured and shipped out of a certain facility. That's an easy way to gather leads. Uh, just yesterday, I drove past a new Amazon facility that's being built in Western New York. And there's a whole lot of rental equipment uh, for like construction equipment there. There's a whole bunch of building materials being shipped in there. Things like that. Just having situational awareness of what's happening around you and in your area. Um, that gives you an idea of, hey, somebody is shipping all this equipment or someone's bringing all this uh, steel in or you know, all these concrete blocks in. Simple things like that leads and lead generation, it's all around us. So just always have your eyes open and you know, stay, uh, stay focused on that. Pretty straightforward, roll on to number four, yep. leveraging so your network. Leveraging your network, right? So this could be anything from gathering referrals from existing customers to your social media networks, like your LinkedIn connections or any kind of Facebook groups that you're in, anything like that. Um, even personal relationships, right? You may have worked with someone in the past that now works at a company. Maybe they're not the traffic manager, but you're one step closer to somebody that works in their procurement or transportation department. So um, leveraging the, the full extent of how far of a reach you have just on your personal lifetime. That's, that's what that one was all about. One of the most effective ways to do this is to go through all of the places you've ever delivered to and start prospecting those because there's a commonality, right? Leveraging the relationship, right? Being able to say to them on a prospecting call, we've delivered to your location. You know, our drivers really appreciated how efficient you are getting them out, right? Being able to say something, building on that commonality, right? It is the fastest place to build trust, right? You have a whole network of these in most of your brokerages. Start leveraging those to be able to build out some more customers. Definitely. So last on the list from the previous webinar was to use searchable databases. Um, if you're at a larger brokerage, your company likely has an internal CRM that you can be using, right? But outside of that, so don't limit yourself, obviously you've got Google. Um, you've got things like LinkedIn where you can search for um, folks based on an industry or their role in the company. You've got um, websites like ThomasNet or Zoom Info where you can get contact information. There's chambers of commerce, right? So whether it's a, um, a county or a town or a state chamber of commerce, a lot of these um, chambers of commerce now have online searchable directories. Ben, you had one too that you use, I think it was Reference USA. And as long as you have a library card or a, li a library membership online, you get free access to that. 
Absolutely. It's phenomenal. If you have a local library card, you can usually enter it through, I, I believe you need to go through your local library's portal to be able to get the free access of Reference USA, but it has all of the NAICS codes, it has all the SIC codes, it, it's, it's a comprehensive database of every company, and then you can also see like the company structures, right? So like, yes, this parent company, okay, so if I, that's another great opportunity to leverage your network, right? If you've got a customer, and you get into this network, you can see that sometimes they're owned by other customers and they're like sister companies. That's another great way to be able to find a prospect that is close to one you're already working with. Hey, I know you guys are owned by the same company. We work a lot with ABC. I know you guys are owned by the same company. That's a great way because you don't have as much of a hurdle to get over and trust, right? If they onboarded you at their sister company as a carrier, the likelihood that they'll onboard you at the other company is pretty high. Yeah, so last thing before we move on, um, with these five, think about steps three, four, and five, right? All ways to identify and find leads. That's gonna give you a massive amount of information. So to be efficient with that, that's where one and two come into play. Finding a niche, right? Don't go after all, every, you know, all the 3,000 leads that you generated, um, but find that niche and then hone in on that, be efficient, and then batch those calls for efficiency. So that's a, a brief summary of last, uh, or two months ago's webinar. Let's move on to the three-step program to close more business in 2022. So as a kind of a warm-up to this, obviously we, we just wrapped up the previous webinar. Um, it's the end of the year. So your shippers, they might be slowing down or maybe in a week or so, they might be doing inventory, whatever the case might be. This is a great time to not just reflect on how you performed this year in 2021. You know, did you set goals? If you did set them, did you reach them? Um, how, how far above or below your goal did you actually end up? So beyond that, it's a great time to then plan and forecast for 2022. And that's the real main reason we wanted to focus on this in December. Do you want to add anything else to that, Ben? Yeah, just mindset-wise? Right. It's a really good time of year. Um, a lot of things are slowing down a little bit. Everybody knows what's going on in the supply chain right now. But if you do have customers that are winding down or taking brief breaks as they're planning inventory for next year, what have you, like use this time now because there is no opportunity cost, right? You're not not doing something to do this. Use this time to lead gen. Use this time to look at the past year and ask yourself, like, did you finish this year where you guys wanted to? If so, great. Where do you want to be this time next year? If not, why? What were the specific things that you think could be improved on to help get you there next year, right? And the better questions you can ask yourself and your team, the more specific they are, the better the answers and the better the guidance you'll have for understanding what did or didn't work last year, right? this is the period of time to start doing this it's not just to have new year's resolutions it's also because you're able to look at it kind of comprehensively as we're planning for next year yep so let's move on to the next slide here um to give you guys a, a high level overview on the three main items that we have here we're going to be talking about how you're contacting prospects then we're going to talk about how you're conducting your follow-up and finally we're going to talk about how you're using your technology and your tools as part of this process so um, ben, you and I say this all the time. There is no pill you can take that just gets you more business. There's no quick fix, right? This is a methodology and a, a, a list of best practices that you can implement. And it's not one size fits all, right? There's going to be certain things that you've got to tweak to your specific niche or your part of the market that you're working in. So keep that in mind as we go through these slides and all these tips uh, in today's webinar. So the first the one, one thing on here... Go ahead, the then. one thing I wanted to add to that too, because it's it's a really good point, right? We get asked this a lot, like, what is the one thing I can say that just gets me a customer, right? Or what is the silver bullet? What's the line? What is the script I need, right? There is nothing, right? Like, you're not trying to jump from here to where you want to go in one step, right? Wherever we want to go, right? It's that, you always laugh at this proverbs, but it's greatness is just incrementally doing your best every day, right? We're not trying to do light leap years from where we were yesterday. We're trying to get incrementally better in every one of these processes, because if you put them all together, it will get you where you want to go. It will get you the growth. It will get you the efficiencies. And it's just making sure that you're diligent around what you're doing. Absolutely. So the first two bullet points we have is batching your prospects and blocking out time for prospecting. So I want to I want to really, really hit this point home that you are not going to get any business, let alone grow your business if you don't put the time in. All right, 
Great brokering is a sales job and sales jobs rely on the amount of activity that you're going to put into it, right? If you make zero calls, you're going to get zero new customers, okay? If you make one call, you're probably still not going to get a new customer. So you've got to, we talked about setting goals and measuring your goals throughout the year just a few minutes ago, but um, you want to make sure that you've got a set amount of time dedicated to prospecting. And we talked about there's really two sides to this or two main activities. There's the lead generation and the actual contact part of it, right? Um, so we're gonna, we talked about lead gen in the last webinar, so I want to talk about the actual prospecting activity today. So batching those together, this is kind of a revisit from the last one, but this is a, a huge way to increase your efficiency, right? Like we said, if you're going to be hitting on steel or lumber, right? Hit all those same like customers or prospects back to back to back, right? Don't hop back and forth. Don't call a steel company and then look up a lumber company and then look up a um, stone company and then look up a you know grocery chain or something like that. You want to batch them so they're all together. But at the same time, you want to block out time in your day. And um, Ben, we were just talking about this earlier before the webinar is if your goal is to do five hours or let's say four hours a day of prospecting, it doesn't all have to be at one time. So it let's kind of break be. down. Yeah, let's break down what tends to be a beneficial way to break up your day for prospecting, what, those chunks of time. So you want to look at no more than 90 minutes. I prefer like 45 minutes to an hour, usually hour blocks. And then I break them up with other activities, right? Because it is arduous to be rejected for two, three hours at a time. And then we start to feel this negative emotion around it. And then we start avoiding it, right? So when you do it in bite-sized pieces, it becomes like a less like just heavy task to do is the first thing. The second thing with this is human beings, all of us, especially freight brokers, have this issue where we deal with the urgent over the important. If a carrier is yelling at us, especially a customer is yelling at us, that always tends to take precedent over prospecting. What the reality is, is that's just supporting the existing business. That doesn't get you growth, right? The part of your business that is always gonna drive the growth and prevent the risk of losing that customer and having nothing, right, is prospecting. But nobody's ever gonna yell at you and tell you to prospect. There's never gonna be a carrier screaming at you, a customer or anybody else telling you, you need to stop what you're doing to do this. And that's why it's up to us to come up with what are these goals for ourselves? What are we trying to do on a daily and weekly basis? And come up with an average number you can hit over this week, right? So we always use round numbers and we'll say like, let's say you have a book and you're just trying to grow and you've come up with a number of, I'm gonna make 40 prospecting calls a day. We say multiply that times five then eliminate one of the days because you're gonna have things that are gonna come up that are gonna go wrong. We don't wanna set ourselves up for failure. So come up with something reasonable. Instead of 250 calls a week, knock it down to 200, and to Nate's point, try to find some times of no more than an hour to an hour and a half where your customers tend not to need things. When those things happen, hopefully you're in a position where you can delegate or somebody can watch your phone or your emails while you are prospecting for that hour so that you can focus on this task and this task alone. Yeah, and I wanna hit on the time management piece too. There's a happy medium, right? There's the um, you know, it's not too long where you eventually you're like, oh, this is so mundane. It's the same thing over and over, but it's also not too short because you'll find that sweet spot when you start making your dials and your phone calls, you get into a really good rhythm. You start to feel better about it. You start to sound a lot better on the phone. Your confidence goes up. So you've got to find that happy medium. And again, this is different for everybody. If you're brand new at brokering, you're going to have to spend a lot more of these uh, blocks of prospecting time to grow your book of business. Whereas if you're seasoned and you've figured out, you found your voice and your calls and you know how to hop on the phone and be efficient, those might be shorter blocks of time and there's going to be less of them because you're spending more time on existing business. But the, the takeaway is you should never eliminate prospecting from your business because at some point you are going to lose a customer for some reason. They might go out of business. Um, they might get purchased by somebody. You might screw up and lose them as a, as a customer. They might have a slow part of the season. Um, a pandemic could happen or something, right, that shuts down their operation. These are all things to consider. And the other side about this too is if, you know, if you run a larger brokerage or a medium-sized brokerage, you need to, you should implement this in, in part of your mentorship or your training and development for your existing team members, right? If they aren't given any kind of expectations or goals 
uh, or they don't set their own goals, they have nothing to measure that back again. So if they're not succeeding or if they're failing, they have no feedback as to why what they did did not work. So um, incorporate this into your, you know, your ongoing development for your team members and into your meetings that you have periodically throughout the year. Absolutely. I want to add one thing to the batching. I don't want to keep going back and forth, but the other big benefit of batching is when you're prospecting in an industry for an hour, right? And you're reaching a few people, you tend to get other insights and conversations with those prospects about what's going on in the industry, right? Like, I don't know, just for an example, say I'm prospecting aluminum and I talk to somebody at Alcoa and they're telling me, oh, they're having issues in Tennessee, but they're also having supply issues because of the cost of aluminum and the distribution. Well, what do you think I'm going to use for my next call, right? I'm going to literally use the same information I learned while prospecting on my next call. Hey, Jimmy at ABC Aluminum. You know, I was talking to some of the folks over at Alcoa this morning. I'm name dropping them. And hey, you know, they had mentioned they were running into the same issue. Are you guys running into that? That immediately shows that I am in the industry, that I am like well versed in what's going on. I didn't have to find that elsewhere. I literally just became more efficient by taking what I learned in another prospecting call and been able to apply it to the next. And then you kind of get into these flows. And that's why it becomes less arduous, less work when you're kind of grouping them together. So kind of keep that in mind when you're putting your batches together. But back Absolutely. to methods of contact and goal setting. Do you want to cover a little bit on like how to bounce back between calls and emails, Nate? Or Yeah. And so we have on here, obviously, phone, email, text, in person. I mean, there's there's a variety of ways that you can contact somebody. Um, I will tell you that the phone tends to be the most efficient as far as the amount of dials you make versus conversations you'll have. Um, but based on your preference and what tends to work for you in, in your book of business, you're going to want to try to mix this up and find your sweet spot. So obviously we already talked about phone. It's an effective way. And you, at the end of the day, you just, you have to get over the fear of picking it up and talking to a, a stranger, right? And that's a whole nother discussion, but email, you can effectively use email to, you know, either preemptively let the person know that you're going to call them, right? That's one way to use email. You can also use it at the end of the phone call to send over, you know, just your basic contact information or whatever the case might be. So email is a good way to, to kind of balance that communication. The, the thing with email that can be a slippery slope is if you're afraid of the phone, people will tend to hide behind the keyboard and just type emails and send them off. And they think that's going to be an effective way. You, you can't solely prospect via email. Sometimes you can. But the ma overwhelming majority of the time, it's not going to be effective. Um, yeah. I, I want to hit on, go ahead, Ben. I just want to add something to that. So right now with what's happening with everybody going home during the pandemic, a lot of people aren't working in the buildings they normally are. And a lot of people that were prospecting, their phone lines aren't functioning because of this, because they've had to send people home and back. So you will find that sometimes if you're prospecting some phone number and you're really not able to reach somebody, this could be the reason. So one of the things we've seen most effective with clients that we've worked with is mixing in the emails within their calls, but keeping them short, not letters, not blogs. You're talking maybe four or five statements that are very direct that say what you need because those are, those are reaching the person you're trying to call yeah. usually. And you at least know that you've gotten that across and, and it's a great way to, to initiate the phone call. I would never suggest trying to close a customer with email, but I think that right now they can be very effective at getting somebody to the phone, which then you drive them to the next step. Yeah, so I wanna talk about text and then in person. So texting, and we'll talk about texting follow-up in the next section, but um, I will tell you, I have found this to be very effective. If I have somebody's personal cell phone number or even their work cell phone number, if I can send them a text, just to ask them if they're free or just to send them a quick message and get in there, just get in their mind that, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to reach out to you if you've got some time. That tends to be very effective. So think about texts versus emails. There's a, there's a bunch of stats out there um, that, you know, when it comes to emails, think about all the junk you get in your email box all day long, right? It could be deleted, it could be read for two seconds and then deleted. Um, the overwhelming majority, so I think it's like 99% or higher of text messages are read. Okay, whereas email is much, much lower. It's probably closer to 50 or 60%. So if you can get a cell phone number, that text message can be a very, very effective way to just start the conversation or just to send them a follow-up really quick right afterward. And we'll get more into follow-up in the next section. 
but texting is is very great and some people prefer to text over email or hop on the phone when it comes to scheduling a meeting or something like that so make sure you're communicating with your prospects in the way that they want to be communicated with and the last one is in person we we get asked all the time hey should i go fly out to texas and try to go visit eight different companies you know on this one day in person is a very very expensive and inefficient use of your time when it comes to prospecting for follow-up and business development and growth of your book it can be extremely effective but it's very very costly and it has a um you know a very low number of contacts you can hit versus hopping on the phone absolutely and let's kind of segue into what to ask and what to say on a call i think what's important here and especially for some of the newer brokers or even managers that are managing newer brokers right is that we need something that we are going to say to the prospect, which sounds obvious, right? But it's gotta be something that matters to them. Think what's in it for me and put yourself in their shoes, right? Because so many people that are new to this or just been out of practice in prospecting, take this approach of, hey, I just wanted to chat with you a little bit about your freight, wanted to see if, you know, might like, you know, just learn a little bit more. And that's a genuine question. And that is what we're trying to do, right? But put yourself on the receiving end of that. If somebody calls you unsolicited and you answer the phone and they go, hey, I just wanted to learn about your life and to see if there was something I might be able to provide you, right? How eager are we going to be to stop doing what we're doing to have that conversation, right? Not likely. We need something that we're going to lead with. So think about what it is that your advantage is in your brokerage. Back to the last webinar, this is where your niche is valuable, right? So maybe your niche is you move building materials out of the southeast. Maybe your niche is you handle produce um, primarily coming out of Mexico through Nogales. Maybe your niche is that you handle open deck steel coils, right? Whatever that niche is, we need something that should matter to the prospect, right? Like, yes. why should they want to work with us? Because their first objection to all brokers is, well, if you guys all have access to the same resources, why do I need you over the other brokers I'm already working with? This is where your niche matters. This is why you caring and knowing what your value is to the market matters to that prospect, right? So I want to I want to add on to that. So this is all about growing more business and closing more business in 2022. So look back at 2021, right? This is why goal setting and looking back on your, you know, how well did you perform over the past year or quarter? This is why it's so important because you'll be able to figure out what did you do good at and where did you fall short, okay? And if you can isolate where you really excelled and you performed way above the average that's what you're good at and what i want to say next is the idea of scripts versus having a just a fluid conversation right some brokers think oh i need a sales script i'm just going to have i'm just going to read off of it i'm going to have my reps read off of it you sound robotic um i'm not a big fan of scripts when it comes to that if you truly know and understand where you're beneficial and what you're good at you should be able to clearly express that in a fluid conversation. So, uh, and it takes time, right? And you might, maybe you're starting off with just some bullet points and you've got just notes on your desk or on your computer of the items that you wanna hit on, right? Don't read them off like a customer service script of someone calling you or you calling them, right? Have a fluid conversation. And I think the, a lot of questions to ask that are good too, like Ben, like you mentioned, is think about what you heard on previous calls, right? Ask, is this the kind of stuff that you guys are experiencing as well? People like to talk about themselves and what they're going through in their life. They don't want to necessarily hear you just verbally puke up all the things that you want to read off your script, right? They want to talk about themselves and it's a great time for you to just use your two ears, open them up, listen and take notes. Two ears and one mouth, use them proportionately, right? We should be asking questions only to get them to talk more, right? We should be listening twice as much as we're talking on a prospecting call. If you find yourself talking for minutes after minutes and they're not saying anything, ask a question, right? You need to get them engaged. At the end of the day, we're trying to establish trust and we're trying to get them to know us, right? So yeah. don't be afraid to have the little conversations around small talk, getting to know them, finding interests outside of business are a great way to build rapport and trust quicker. Nate's huge on sports, knows every team, any any sport, no matter what it is, he's got the ability to build rapport with that, right? It doesn't have to be sports, it could be anything. Find out what interests the person you're talking to, and if you're towards the beginning or end of the week, I always ask, how was their weekend? Not because it's just 
mundane small talk because it's an opportunity to learn about what they do outside of work, the things they're really passionate about. Same things towards the end of the week. It's a great opportunity to bring in more of the personality because at the end of the day, like that's why shippers work with their brokers longer. That's, that's the stickiness of the relationship. They like the people they work with. They like spending time with them. They like talking to them. That all comes from not just business, not just following through on getting a truck, but getting to know them as human beings and what's important in their lives. Yeah, lastly, before we move on, I, I wanna hit on, the, um, we talked about you know how many calls to make and how much time to spend and, and figuring out all that. Um, you are, if you're newer at this, you are going to strike out a lot at the beginning. And I can't stress enough that it's, that's just part of this game. And if you, if you can't swallow the fact that you're gonna be told no a lot, it might not be the right industry for you. Um, once you can get over that and accept that, that's where you'll find your voice, you'll get way more confident in the first you know, 10, 15 seconds of each phone call is gonna go so much smoother. You're gonna, have, you're gonna figure out what is your icebreaker, right? Maybe it's asking about how their weekend was or what's going on in, in their part of the country or whatever the case might be, but repetition, I promise you, the more you do this, the more comfortable you will get. All right, let's All move right. on to follow number up. two, number which two. is about follow-up. So a lot of this communication is, um, a lot of these are gonna hit on the same part as, as initial contact, but now we're talking about the follow-up process, right? Um, go ahead, Ben. I just wanted to start this with context, right? So the average customer, and this is across all sales, and it's it's definitely holds true in our industry. You will need to follow up between eight and 12 times before there's enough trust for them to be able to make a decision. That's average across the industry, right? So when you think about follow-up, I think people think like, well, just when do I call them next? But when you understand that this is what it's gonna take before you start moving loads, it, it aligns your expectations where they should be, right? Because there's nothing more frustrating than when you expect to close a customer in two phone calls and it takes eight to 12. But when you know it takes eight to 12, then you can kind of pace out one, how long you're on the phone with them because the goal isn't to just stay on the phone until they hang up. Sometimes we need to get off the phone based on where the conversation's going. So you wanna kind of spread out these conversations over this eight, eight phone calls or about two months and realize that like that's about the time frame to get enough trust to really have a relationship to start doing business. Yeah, absolutely. And I also wanna add in, there, there's gotta be intentionality when it comes to your follow-up. Call for a reason, right? I, I heard a phrase once that went something like, um, you, you should never be touching base unless it's baseball, right? Don't call just to mm -hmm. touch base. Um, Cause that doesn't really say anything. It's just kind of a generic phrase, right? You should have some reason, right? So think about, you know, how did the last call go? Did they even answer? If mm -hmm. not, then you're treating this like it's another first call, right? Um, if you called at a bad time, right? You've at least made some sort of contact, but you haven't had a good conversation, right? Did you have a conversation? Did they give you a lot of objections or did it go good? You've got to treat each one of these follow-ups appropriately, right? You're not, gonna, you're not gonna ask the same questions or have the same conversation with somebody who you haven't talked to yet versus someone that you've gotten five objections objections from and now you've got a chance to um, rebuttal them in further detail. So make sure you're treating them accordingly. Absolutely, I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've sat down to make phone calls with them and I look and they've been leaving, it's the same note for like three months worth of calls, voicemail, 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 voicemail. Well, okay, like, well, one, my first reaction is like, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. The other thing that jumps out at me is like, okay, like vary your approach, one, if somebody left you a voicemail every week, by the sixth voicemail, like, are you ever calling this person back or ever returning it? No, especially if they're leaving voicemails, like, I wanna chat with you, or hey, just looking to touch base, give me a call. Like, that to me sounds like somebody just had time on their hands and they wanted to spend it just BSing with me. Like, you need a reason. You've gotta have purpose on your follow-ups, whatever that is. So the best way to do this is make sure you're taking notes from your last call. Put what your voicemail was have a, a set couple of voicemails that you leave, but make sure you're giving yourself enough notes on the context of the last conversation so you know where to pick it up next time. It's absolutely invaluable. The yep. other thing is don't, over, don't overlook the fact that if you had a three minute phone call with them two weeks ago and you call them back two weeks later, just because it was important to you and you're excited, 
do not expect that person to remember that you know 120 second phone call from two weeks ago as soon as they got off the phone they went right back to whatever they were overwhelmed or busy doing and they probably forgot all about it so you don't necessarily need to come up with an entirely new thing to say every follow-up if it's been two weeks you can kind of reiterate what you talked about last time but you need to have a purpose like you don't just want to sound like you're just calling for the sake of picking up the phone to call yep so um having a purpose you're right you know not just touching base right having some intentionality or reason behind calling them is is extremely important so that can be a variety of things if they give you an objection you can go back to that objection and, and discuss that point if they had questions you can bring those you know you can present them answers um if one of their problems that they're running into is capacity in a certain area Hopefully you did your homework, contacted some carriers and found out if you do have um, capacity in your partner carrier network. So those are good things to discuss. Um, when should you follow up or how often? Uh, it's funny, so we, we had somebody that we talked with recently that he came out of used car sales and he thought he was supposed to follow up you know, the same day or the next day and keep calling. And what he didn't realize was in freight, it's a lot different than selling a car. Okay. If someone's going to buy a car, they're going to go buy a car one time and they want to buy it right away. And they're obviously going to either, you know, one or a small handful of uh, dealerships. In freight, it's a lot different, right? They've got a lot of shipments going on. They've got a lot of brokers or carriers out there. Um, so if you become that person that calls twice a day or every single day and leaves that voicemail, they're going to probably block your number or just never answer your call. You, you become almost a nuisance at that point. So there's some kind of a, a, a sweet spot. It could be, hey, maybe it's two or three days down the road, or if it's on a Friday, maybe it's you know middle of the week, the next week, whatever the case might be. But if you go too long, like Ben, you just mentioned, um, you you might kind of fall out of their memory, or at least the details or specifics of your call are going to fall out. So you you know every few days um, could be beneficial, but at a certain point, you can stagger those out further and further apart. Like if somebody tells you um, that the better time to talk to them is going to be next quarter or next month. Don't call them the next day, right? You there's a lot of subjectiveness, and you got to put that all together and figure out what what really makes sense. All right, so that's as far as when you should follow up. Um, let's talk. I know we're we're kind of already getting towards the tail end of the webinar here. Let's talk about um, you know recycling a lead. You know, at at what point do you say, you know, I've called this person so many times, it's not going to work out. What's your methodology on that? Mine is you try to tend to throw it out, like I'll throw it out a quarter or a season. It depends on their shipping season and what I know about it. So if it's produce, or we'll use Christmas trees for a good example, right? Like I'm gonna prospecting them through August, probably through October, but if I'm continuing to call and it needs recycled, it's going to next year. And I'm probably gonna start in July, maybe next year. So the seasonality of the business has a lot to do with when you should recycle it. Also the context of what they're telling you. If they've got a big project, a big, big bid coming up, and let's say you're talking to them in November and they say it's supposed to start in February, you wanna start about 45 days before that. So then I'm gonna recycle it back to that. If it's just a dead lead, which means I haven't been able to reach anybody, but it's a company I've always wanted to work with, I might throw it out there for a month or two later. And I'm also going to find other points of contact to reach out to as well. That has yeah. a lot to do with what you're gonna recycle. Have you been calling the same point of contact, the same phone number, the same email over and over for two months? find somebody else to reach out to. So that brings up a great point. So we use the word recycle on purpose instead of throwing it out. If a company is just legitimately not a shipper, yeah, you can throw them out if you identify that they're, just, they're a disqualified lead. But recycling could be, hey, you know what? Six months down the road, I'm gonna try this company again. Think about the great resignation that's happened recently, right? People are turning over in their positions at their company that they're working for. So chances are, if you call six months later, you might find out there's a different person there that maybe you can then build rapport with, okay? It's a whole other conversation. I had a guy recently that he took a, a year out of the business due to a non-compete and he got back in, super excited, found out every single one of his top customers has a new point of contact, right? So to him, it was not a good thing. But for those of you that have leads that you're I'm not going anywhere with them, I'm not making any traction, we're just not clicking, this is a good thing. This gives you an opportunity to start with a, a clean slate and just totally fresh. So absolutely, uh, I want to add in a nutshell. If you want to add anything else before we move on, I'm just adding one thing as we flip to technology is that you should also have a qualifying number. The ones I tend to use is for every point of contact at about 20 truckloads a week is about when they need another broker. 
So that's the qualifier I kind of use, especially for smaller shippers is if they're not shipping at least 20 full truckloads a week, that's about the number I kind of use before I, to your point, throw out the lead or feel like they're probably not a good fit. But that changes for every brokerage and where yep. you're at in the industry and who you're kind of prospecting. Definitely. All right, cool. Uh, we got a poll here. That's right. So how dependent are you on technology? And I missed the rest of the question. It's probably when, when doing pricing or giving rates to your customers. So we're talking about, you know, rating tools, load boards, things like that. Go ahead and, and answer there on a scale from one to five. Um, one would be you don't use technology or five being you're relying on it heavily. So go ahead and pick an answer there. And what we're going to do too is when we get after the poll here, we're going to go through and show you guys a couple of tools that you can use to kind of gauge your competition, see what the capacity in the market looks like, look at national averages, search historical rates, things like that. Because you will get to a point, hopefully, with a lot of your prospects where they're going to want pricing on something. And it could be for a bid or it could be on the spot market. Five is the highest answer. That's good. There is a lot in the three and four. Um, some said one and two. And I will tell you, there there is a caveat to this. So um, the majority of you said that you're you're more dependent on it than than not dependent, uh, which is what we expected. Um, if you have a certain niche or a, you know you've been in business twenty years or whatever, um, and you know your carriers and you know your customers very well, you may not have to rely on technology as heavily as someone that's in growth mode, right? Or in beginning stages of building their book of business up. You may just have your go-to carriers, they're dedicated. They give you a rate. If it changes, I'll let you know your customers go with it. That's awesome. If you don't have to rely on technology, not always a bad thing, but um, there is a, a very, very strong ability to use technology to help you out that a lot of brokers probably don't necessarily use as in depth as we're gonna try to show you here today. Um, so let's think move on to the slide. So Ben, go ahead, talk to us about CRM and the importance there. So one of the biggest things, CRM is gonna be really important because it's the heartbeat of your brokerage. It's literally gonna have everything that you need to do is gonna go in there, right? It's gonna invoice your customers, it's gonna track where your shipments are, it's gonna have everything you need, but it also has the information you have on your historic rates, right? Because the next step after contacting and follow-up is we start getting opportunities. And the first barrier you're going to run into as it relates to opportunities is the shipper is going to want you to cover a truck for less than likely you're going to pay in the spot market. That's the way almost every relationship starts is they want something based on what they've been paying. But that broker usually has a carrier base that's been running those loads. So now that you're being brought in, we need to figure out like, where are we? How are we going to be able to perform for this customer? And the first place we want to look is our CRM. Do we have carriers in our network that have been running lanes similar to what our new prospect wants us to run? Maybe we've run the exact lane. Hopefully, if we are prospecting in areas where we have a strong carrier base, we already have some options that we can offer back to that prospect. Like, hey, we've been running this lane for about this rate. We've got some reliable carriers, right? We don't want to have to go to the market if we have them already. And that's why that's your first stop. And I want to I want to add one more. I want to add the customer side of the CRM, right? So whether it's first contact or it is follow up, your CRM for your customers can very, very effectively be used to schedule follow ups, to leave notes, to add your contacts in there. So if you're not using a CRM, which is a customer relationship management system, you should be. A lot of TMS platforms will have them integrated in. Um, but keep in mind, TMS programs are built by companies that are focused on transportation, not necessarily customer relationship management. So um, having a third-party CRM is not a bad thing. And oftentimes it's, it's beneficial. You can integrate your email or your phone right to it. So you can have a quick press a button and your phone lights up and it'll dial the number for you. That way you're not fat fingering anything. Um, it can log all your emails. It'll tell you when your prospect has opened up your email, if they've clicked on a link, things like that. So um, that's one quick little tip there on um, using your CRM. Next, we're going to show you, um, you know, some load board tools that'll help you out. So I wanna, I wanna show you guys um, searching through loads to see what your competition looks like, searching for trucks to see what the market capacity looks like, 
and also using uh, rating tools like RateView to get a sense of where the market has changed. Um, so Randy, if you wouldn't mind, pass over the presenter role to me and I will share my screen. And again, these aren't the only ways to do this. We're just gonna highlight a couple little things. Okay, we got pulled up here? Yep, we can see it. Okay, awesome. Uh, so Ben, the lane that we picked here, and I just refreshed this a couple minutes ago, we did Chicago to LA for just a standard van, okay? So what I did here is I actually, as a as a broker, right, if you've got DAT power, you can do both truck searching and load searching. And the reason we wanted to do, do the load search here is not because I'm looking for loads, I just want to see who else am I competing against right now for capacity, right? Who else is posting the same or a similar lane as me? If it's the same lane, well, that's going to tell me I might that might be my direct competition for this specific customer. If it's a similar lane, right, picking up from the same area, we're going to be fighting over the exact same capacity, okay? And one of the cool things in here that you can do is look at what they're posting their rate for. And you can click on rate and it'll sort it, right? Highest to lowest. <clears throat> so look at this. Like the, I, we, this Chicago to LA lane, we had five exact matches and a whole bunch of similar ones. Uh, but look at the range of the rates in here. Anywhere from $3,200 down to $2,200 is what's being offered by brokers right now. And keep in mind those numbers when we get to the uh, the rate view part of it. Uh, but Ben, anything you want to add on here as far as the, the load searching? Yes. So it's probably one of the most underutilized things I've seen working with brokers is people that go to cover a load in the spot market, which means they need to go get a load covered today. Prospect called them out of the blue. Hey, can you help me on this load? But what they do then is they only look at the historicals. The reality is, is this is what is gonna tell you is happening in the open market right now if you need a truck. It's the market, it's the information your carriers are seeing. So when you are gonna actually try to negotiate this load, this is what they're seeing your competition is. And you need to know where the market is to know what information you've gotta take back to your customer because it changes throughout the day. I still have this screen up from earlier this morning when we looked at these. And the high from three hours ago was $7,500 on the same lane. So you can see how much the spot market shifts even just within a day. And knowing that is what's going to give you the context to take back to your prospect to be able to determine whether or not you're going to win this load, right? Actually be able to book it and actually turn this into a customer, right? Because before yeah. that, it's just, it's just a shot at doing it, right? So yeah. this information gives you the questions you want to ask your prospect. Hey, does this have to go out today? Okay, well, this is what you're competing against. Okay, does it need to go out in the next two, three hours? Or does it need to go out in the next five days? If I've got five to seven days to work on this load, now all of a sudden I can work more towards historic, which Nate can show you in a minute through rate view, and we're gonna be on the lower end of the market, right? Yep. You're gonna get one of two things, a rate or a date. But I always say your prospect can't get both. If you're gonna pick the day it's gotta go out, I have to get it for what the market is gonna provide it for. If I've got four or five or six days to work on it, I can work you towards the lower end because I've got enough days to find that carrier that needs that lane that you have. Absolutely. So let's move on to truck searching. Fairly basic, um, probably the most commonly used tool for a lot of newer brokers is just look at what kind of trucks are out there. So uh, again, I refreshed this a couple of minutes ago. This shows um, the amount of, or the trucks that are actually posted in Chicago, right? And it could be that they want to go to LA or it could be that they want to, they're just open to going anywhere. So this gives you an idea of who's where, how far are they from the origin? That's the DHO, your dead ahead from origin, okay? Um, so that's the truck searching. So using those two in conjunction is a good way to get a comparison of your competition versus the actual capacity that's posted out there. And that's the biggest thing we need to know, right? How many trucks are available there, right? Like what is the market? And it's been hard to gauge through the pandemic because honestly, the trucks had so much leverage, they didn't have to post themselves up. They could just pick any load they wanted, call it and get a above market rate. You're starting to see a little bit more of that. And on beefier lanes that are you know more consistent, you see more trucks. But I always look at these two things before I go back to my prospect because I wanna know the market. If they're reaching out to somebody they've never worked with, it's likely, it's pretty likely that there's not a lot of trucks there. It's also pretty likely that their other brokers have already come back and said, we can't do it. So yep. know that's usually where you start with a new prospect. So we're gonna wrap up here with rate view. 
uh, if you've used Rateview, Rateview before, this is nothing new to you. This is a good way just, and again, this is the same lane, Chicago to LA. And you can change your, your time range on here or even expand out how close you are to each destination. If you wanna go by zip code or go out to the, the regional market, uh, the region or the market, you can do that by just sliding these lines. But you can see how it shifted. But keep in mind, okay, here's the rates we're seeing. So, and I believe Rateview takes out the top and bottom, like 5% Five? or whatever, to yeah. keep the outliers out of it. But look at this range, right? 30, just about 3,400 at the top down to about 2,850 on the bottom. And Ben, you saw one for $7,500 being offered just a couple hours ago. That goes to tell you that person needed that shipment move. That, that was a date that they needed, right? They had to go today. Yep. They didn't care about the rate. So they went for more than double what the current average is, right, in the last seven days. So And usually, and usually exactly. And usually there, there's going to be outliers, right? But remember, the context of this information is really what's important, right? If you're quoting or you're working to get something over a long period of time, a week or two weeks, you've got to work on a load, I'm going to be putting more weight on the averages, right? So more emphasis on rate view. If I've got to get this load covered today, this afternoon, they call me at two in the afternoon and it's got to be picked up by close. Now, all I care about is the market. The only reason I'm looking at rate view is so that I have information to negotiate with the carriers and to try to keep them honest. Because if they know you've got to get it out, they're going to do everything they can to get every dollar out of you. Absolutely. Um, so that's the tech side in a nutshell. Um, do we have a close-up slide, slide or a summary slide here? Okay. So we do have a few minutes left. Um, yeah, I am. Go I ahead, am Randy. going. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we had some questions come in. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been very busy presenting. Thank you. It was great. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at some of those questions. Uh, so just to get us started, um, someone had asked in terms of time of the day to prospect, um, asking a little more specific, like what is what time do you recommend in terms of calling people? So I'll I'll uh, I'll take the start on this, and Ben, I'll let you. Um, hop in afterward. Put yourself in your customer's shoes, okay? Because the the time of you time of day for you and the time of day for them is going to be very different, right? So um, if you're working, let's say you know nine to five or eight to four or whatever is the bulk majority of your work time, think about your customer, right? What time does their facility open at? What day of the week is it? And what time zone are they located in, right? I once accidentally called somebody in Alaska and didn't know they were in Alaska, and it was like 4 a.m. when they answered the call. And it was really embarrassing and I had to apologize. But think about Monday mornings, right? Everyone's putting flyers out, probably not a good time to, to try and prospect and have a 30 minute long conversation, right? Um, same thing might be Friday afternoon when trucks are falling off, but at the same time, you might have an opportunity Friday afternoons um, to hop in on that leftover spot freight. Um, ben, you wanna add anything else in there? Yeah, I think best practices are the only times I would say I would probably not start dialing or first thing Monday. But again, it depends on the industry because there are some places you can call. But usually the people that we're prospecting are catching up throughout the weekend and are usually have their largest or most to catch up from when they left the office Friday. So I tend to not do first thing Monday, but any other time during the week, I will vary it based on how effective my group prospecting is because I've got a hundred or whatever steel prospects I'm going to call today. Well, I look at what who I was able to reach throughout the day and I look back at the information I got in those calls that I talked to a gatekeeper and they said their managers tend to be there Tuesday afternoons that I talked to three other people that said that time was good for them. I'm probably going to start prospecting it, you know, Tuesdays in the afternoons. Yep. Good days also as it relates to prospecting, I think the statistically most emails are read on Tuesdays. So Tuesdays tend to be a good day to send emails. Um, but again, it varies based on the industry. Like when I used to, I prospected bakeries for a long time, I would call them at like six in the morning. I would go to the office early because I knew they worked like three in the morning till 10 in the morning. So you could reach people then. Um, another good tip is you can tend to reach decision makers that are higher up in the company or like larger managers, VPs, they're usually in before their gatekeepers. So if you've been trying to reach somebody higher up to get approved, a good one-off is to try reaching them at like 7.30 occasionally, and you'll usually catch them. Here's another one too, um, and this is applicable for produce and some other things too, but if you're, let's say you're on the East Coast, 
and you get the majority of your operational work done by about five o'clock Eastern. It's only two or three o'clock on the West Coast. Think about these, you know, produce distribution companies or farms that they might work prim primarily like six to two on their operation, and then they're freed up and doing administrative work. It's a great time. You finish up your day, you can call out to the West Coast or Mountain Time Zone. Might be a really good effective time um, for calls like that. And it's dependent. You'll, you'll get to know with a lot of your prospects in the follow up process when they're, you know, when they tend to be freed up, and that's when using your CRM to keep notes of when the best time to call them is, is gonna be great. And uh, just quickly, um, we, we kind of run out of time, but um, Ben, someone had asked the name of the uh, resource you had mentioned that you, the database that you have access to the library. Yeah. It's Reference USA. Okay, and then I, I um, <laughs> the questions are coming in and we've run out of time. I don't know if you want to just one. There's someone, um, Andrew had asked a couple, like, when do you quit chasing and what are the best tools for quoting? I think we had on both of those. Um, okay. So quoting, we talked, you know, rate view, historical data from your own um, database, um, actually calling carriers and finding out what their asking price is. That's a good way to, to do quoting. Um, when to throw them out or recycle them. We, we said average is eight to 12 contacts. If you get to like 15 or 20 and it's just not going well, throw them on a six month follow-up. That's a general rule of thumb, but every situation is different. Okay. Well, at this point, um, I think um, just to be respectful of everyone's time, um, we're gonna close. I wanna thank, uh, I want to thank Ben and Nate. Um, this is a great conversation and, and hopefully everyone in our listening audience has gained some nuggets and tools that they can use moving forward. We will send you a link to the recorded webinar so that you can listen to it again or share it with other people in your organization. And at that point, I wanna wish everyone a happy holiday and um, have a great rest of your day. And again, thank you, uh, Nate and Ben, for presenting today. Thanks for having us. Been a pleasure.